Hi and welcome tonight as people are trickling here in here. We're going to get started in just a second. While you are coming in, go ahead and follow, um, fill out this poll that I have here to let me know who's here tonight. So take a look at this poll and just answer some super simple questions for me really quick to give me an idea of who's here tonight. Okay, looks like the majority of people that we have here tonight are in a suburban area, less than half an acre of property and already have somewhere between one and 49% plant native plants in their property. But we do have some folks who are like, hey, what's a native plant? So don't worry, we're gonna start at the very beginning as well. So there's something for everybody here tonight. Okay, let's go ahead and end this and go ahead and get started. Okay, um, welcome here tonight. My name is Sarah McHale. I am the Community Engagement Specialist with Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking all about how to avoid a bunch of mistakes and, and end up with a successful native plant garden. That's the hope anyway. <laughs> A lot of these are mistakes that I have made. Um, I have been gardening with native plants for about, I don't know, 12, 13 years or so now. Um, my degree is in ecology and I've worked in various environmental jobs over the years and I'm very, very passionate about um, getting native plants on people's properties in ways that make them happy. Um, okay, so who are we? The Land Conservancy of McHenry County. We are a nonprofit land trust located about an hour northwest of Chicago, right on the border of Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, just so everybody knows, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box throughout the program. So as the question pops in your head, just stick it in that Q&A box. I'm going to go through that at the very end and answer questions. Um, I'm also going to be sharing my email address with you, so feel free to just reach out to me if you have any questions. Okay, so we are just northwest of Chicago. Um, what is a land trust? A land trust, what we like to do is preserve and take care of land and also support the landowners who want to do the same thing. And we do that in a whole variety of ways, through education programs, um, through working with landowners who want to put an easement on their property, a conservation easement. That's a way of preserving your property forever. Um, and as a land trust, that is our job, is to basically um, protect that property and uphold the conservation values that you put on it from the very beginning. So even after you no longer own it, we're making sure that it's being cared for. Um, we have a farmland preservation program. We sometimes outright, we will fundraise to outright purchase um, really special parcels of land to protect them. We have a very active volunteer group um, who helps with our stewardship work days to take care of those sites. Um, so we have lots of different programs that we do and we are no different from lots of other land trusts. So if you're somewhere else in the country, I highly recommend that you find your local land trust at that website right there, findalandtrust.org. Just put your zip code in and they will point you um, in the right direction. Become a member, volunteer, sign up for their e-newsletter list, follow them on social media, all different ways you can get involved with them and support them and they can support you in your goals as well. All right, so tonight, we're starting at the very beginning here. What is a native plant and what is an ecoregion? And we're going to talk about like ecoregions and what that is versus 
planting zones that we all hear about all the time. Um, so an eco region, very simply, is just an area of similarity in the natural habitats. So an ecological similarity. So for example, where I am is um, number 53. So eco region 53 there, the Southeast Wisconsin till plain. So there's just a certain set of plants that grow here. Um, and it usually has to do with the hydrology, it has to do with the weather, it has to do with the topography. All of these things kind of set up this community of plants that are gonna grow together. Why do we care? Why does this matter? This matters because what you're doing with a native plant in your garden is mimicking a community of plants. So a native plant is a plant that has grown um, in a certain region or ecoregion for thousands of years, okay, with no human intervention. So when non-native plants get brought in, sometimes they can cause a big kind of disruption, all right? And a lot of times people are like, well, how do I know if a plant is native or not? There are tons of resources out there on how to locate the native range of native plants. I mean, honestly, you can just Google the, the scientific name of that plant. So just put the name of the plant and then native range after it. So Asclepius tuberosa, native range. And you're probably going to end up with this site called Bonap, bonap.org. That's a great way to know down to the county level where a certain plant is native to. Okay. So I highly suggest that people find out more information about your eco regions. And there's different levels of eco regions. Some of them are much, level one is much more broad. Um, and I think it goes down to level five maybe. So it's kind of a fun thing to look into. Um, the e it's on the EPA's website, more information about that. All right, so learning about the communities of plants that you have in your area. I don't care where you live, West Coast, East Coast, Great Lakes region, Midwest, wherever you are, you need to start learning about your plant communities. And I've listed a couple um, resources for here in the Great Lakes region and upper Midwest. Um, there's a site called illinoiswildflowers.info that is not only specific to Illinois. There's a lot of, like plants don't care about political boundaries, okay? Um, with some outstanding information in it where you can click on different communities like, you know, Oak Savannah or different kinds of wetlands or different kinds of prairies. And it's literally going to list out all of the plants found in that community, all right? And then there's flora of the Chicago region. We are really lucky in this, in this area to have this kind of a resource. Now, just so you guys know, the Chicago region stretches through one, two, three, four different states. Um, so it's a lot. But Floor of the Chicago region is a, it's not a beginner's guide, <laughs> definitely not, but it's a fountain of information where for every single plant found in this area, it lists the associates found with it. Those are just friends. So when plants grow together in a community, um, they develop like nutrient exchange systems with each other through their root systems and fungus and bacteria, and they all kind of support each other. That's what you want. You want that in your garden, okay? So if you don't live here in Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, Indiana, wherever it is, um, I suggest you literally just start Googling plant communities of Montana or wherever it is and start narrowing that down, okay? Um, what we see here is an oak savanna community ground layer. So an oak savanna is a very common habitat found here in the upper Midwest. Um, a savanna is basically like a woodland, but more open. So more light gets through and lots of different kinds of plants are able to grow on 
in the ground layer because of the increase in light that's able to get through, making the oak savanna an extremely biodiverse community. Biodiverse, what that means is lots of different kinds of life are supported there. Um, this is one of my favorite little communities. So we've got May apple, which is the top layer. I want you to notice these layers that we find in nature because you're going to try to mimic that in your garden. Um, the very bottom layer, it, which looks like that grassy looking stuff, that's called Pennsylvania sedge. So it's not a grass, it's a sedge. Um, and then May apple is up on top. And there's a couple other little things in there too. But and this whole thing is only a foot tall or so. I mean, this is me laying on the ground taking this picture. So even if you have a really small garden with really short plants in it, you're still going to want a tightly knit group of plants, um, not a lot of bare soil, and all these plants are gonna support each other and they're gonna grow in a way that makes them look the most attractive. All right, so what we don't want to pay attention to are these like plant hardiness zones. So I hear all the time people will say, I live in zone 5B. What plants should I put in? Now, from a native plant perspective, that means nothing. So if you, I don't know if you can see where Chicago is on this plant hardiness zone map here. It's right at the bottom of Lake Michigan, that little dot. That light blue color is zone 5B and it stretches all the way west and then pretty far east as well. Way outside of the eco region, if you remember back to that eco region map. So these plant hardiness zones is literally just will a plant grow here? It doesn't matter where the plant is from in the world, it could be from anywhere in the world. If it will grow and thrive in zone 5B, then it's going to be given that classification on the back of the little plant tag that you see at the nursery. So that's like this huge range that could be from all over the place, all right? So don't pay attention to this. Get to know your eco regions. If you're ever on like a Facebook plant group or something, especially native plant group, um, and you're asking questions, it really helps if you note where you live, like your city or county and state, because that's going to help people narrow down what plants to recommend for you. Not, I'm in zone 5B, what native plants should I put in? Well, you can see that's stretching across a lot of different states. It's not going to help us out that much. Okay, so why do we care about native plants? All right, so some of this is probably gonna be review for some of you, but they are huge for wildlife support. So I mentioned earlier that native plants um, have lived in a certain area for thousands of years with no human intervention together um, in a community, okay? So with those plants, there's also insects and birds and mammals and you know reptiles and amphibians and a whole just suite of life that's living there and they've all evolved together so oftentimes specialized relationships will develop as is the case with the monarchs and milkweed i'm sure a lot of you have heard about this right so there's a specialized relationship where monarch butterflies are only able to lay their eggs on plants in the milkweed family. And then those eggs hatch into a caterpillar. Those caterpillars are only able to eat the leaves of milkweed plants um, and they go through metamorphosis and then turn into an adult monarch butterfly. There's countless examples of these kinds of relationships with all different plants, trees, and shrubs wherever you live. So your goal is to have lots of different kinds of plants because then you're going to support lots of different kinds of wildlife. Okay, so these plants also have really um, complicated root structures. Some are going to be deep tap roots. Some are going to be fibrous and hairy. They're all going to kind of occupy the soil in a different way, which makes them very sponge-like to absorb water 
that is running down your downspouts and over your driveway or across your lawn. And they slow that water down and they allow it to soak in. And that's what we want. Um, they don't require any fertilizer. Um, they really, you really, you don't need to, you shouldn't be like spraying insecticide or anything in your native plant gardens. Um, absolutely not. You want a diverse set of insects living in there. They all kind of control each other. And it's just beautiful to have these plants in your yard. Um, it's kind of like a little science lab right in your yard, which is really neat. These, these two girls here had just found a little monarch caterpillar on that common milkweed right in their front yard. So it's biology happening. You know, this is, this is the best kind of remote learning right here. All right, so ecology for our gardens here. What is a community? When I, when I was talking about that earlier. So these communities are just groups of plants interacting with each other, but also animals and the physical environment. So, um, you know, plants that live on a south facing hillside that's exposed to the sun um, might grow a little bit differently than plants growing on a, a north side of a hill that's super shaded, you know? So, the topography plays a role as well. And then, like I mentioned earlier, plant associates are just these plants, they're friends. <laughs> they're found growing together. So an example of that here is this um, Pennsylvania sedge and wild ginger little matrix. And there's some geranium in there too. This diverse matrix of a ground layer that is gorgeous. And not just is it beautiful, but it's super functional and it's holding the soil in place and it's holding moisture in. And it is also uh, suppressing weeds, which is like the best for every gardener. That's what you wanna hear, right? So how do we start? You want to start with a site analysis first. So, um, this is just a fancy word for looking at your property as a whole. And I tell people to try to do this with like an aerial photograph of your property. Anybody can get this off the internet. Um, and look at it as a whole. Where do you have water? Where do you have shade? Where do you have sun? Where do you need to walk all the time? Where are your kids going to insist on playing baseball? Don't turn that into a garden, <laughs> you know? Um, what kind of light, what kind of moisture, what kind of soil do you have? So sometimes people get really, really complicated with this and you don't necessarily have to. Um, you can, and I'm going to go into soil more, but depending on where you are, a lot of times different counties will have free websites where you can actually um, overlay, like type your address in and overlay the soil types that you have. So I was able to do that for this property and it's really neat. And, you know, you might get some weird soil code like 523C2 Kidder Loam. And you're like, I don't know what that means. Well, just Google it. 523C2 Kidder Loam McHenry County Soil or whatever it is. And you'll start to learn about that, okay? DNR might have some of that information or whatever your, your local state natural resource agency is. Um, pay attention to where utility lines are in, in your yard, whether they're below ground or above ground. That's going to uh, potentially play a role in what you can plant there. Also, I don't have it notated on here, but that baseball field, <laughs> it says baseball, those are septic lines through there too. So I'm going to avoid planting trees and shrubs in the septic field. I think the rule of thumb is 25 feet. You wanna keep trees and shrubs out of the septic line, but you absolutely can still plant native plants over septic. It's not a big deal at all. You just need to pick stuff that's going to do well in really dry soil. And let's talk more about, oh, Okay, I'm going to get to soil in just a second. So light levels, what do I mean when I say you need to pay attention to your light? 
So I've got them broken down here by shade, sun, and part sun. And um, when I say this, like less than three hours of shade or, or whatever, or of sun, what does that mean? That means like in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the day, when you are standing there, how much sun is this area actually getting? Is it getting less than three hours of direct sun between say nine and five in July, in the middle of the summer? If so, all right, that's a really shady area and you're going to wanna to look for plants that are going to thrive in that. Sun is going to be more than five hours of direct, um, direct sunlight. And then part sun is that like in between stage. All right, so that would be very similar to around here an oak savanna, mimicking that. And then um, our soil moisture levels defined so dry would be a very sandy or gravelly situation. And back when I was mentioned the septic fields, planting over those. Um, so a lot of septic fields are going to be um, kind of topped with a layer of gravel. So everything just like water just drains super fast through that. So there's a ton of plants that do really well in gravelly situations. I mean, when glaciers receded, um, a lot of them were dropping lots and lots of gravel. So we have tons of native plants that thrive in that harsh situation. That's what this picture is showing here. And it's an absolutely gorgeous gravel hillside, little tiny prairie. Um, maybe you have medium soil, which, or mesic is the other word for that. That's like rich black top soil, or maybe you got like medium wet soil, which is just Sometimes it's mushy <laughs> with moisture. Um, maybe it's even submerged at times. Other times it could be dry. So that's, that's, that's a really fluctuating situation. And there are plants that are fine in that. And then maybe you've just got wet, which is like a consistent water presence. And there's plants that can do that as well. All right, so first what you wanna do is you want to site prep. And the first thing you need to do first, figure out how much money you're willing to spend <laughs> on this garden project. And this is so important because you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. And by that, I mean, you don't want to like clear this huge garden and then be like, oh man, I only have enough money for plants for a quarter of it. You know, start small, you can always get bigger. We recommend that people budget for one plant per square foot. Remember those community pictures I showed you? Those native plants were so tight. They were grouped so tight. That's what we wanna mimic in our gardens are really densely planted plants. Um, once you figured that out, your budget, and um, that's going to tell you how big of an area you're able to do lay it out, lay out your area. I like to use a garden hose or two and uh, it, I'm able to move it around, step back, look at it, you know, it's flexible. Um, you can also use the marking paint or flags or whatever. Then you need to kill the existing vegetation. So if it's just a lawn that you have there, um, one option that you can do is removing the sod with a sod cutter. So we don't recommend tilling. I get this question all the time. We do not recommend renting a rototiller and breaking up all that soil um, because there are lots of weed seeds in that soil. Even if you've been chemically treating this lawn, there's still weed seeds that have blown in and are laying down there in the soil. What weed seeds love is disturbed soil. So as soon as you take a rototiller and you till all that up, all the weed seeds are gonna go crazy and they're gonna germinate all over the place, all right? You're also going to be breaking up any existing um, like fungus or all these little networks of strands basically that are down in the soil. You're gonna just be busting all those up and you don't wanna do that, all right? 
suicide cutting is one option. Um, people always ask, what do I do with the rolls of sod? So you got to figure that out. So you can either kind of tip them over and you got to let them dry out. You can't just flip it and put the grass side down and the soil side up and just plant right into that. We don't recommend doing that. All right. There's still a lot of weed seeds in there. So a friend of mine, he likes to lay them out in the sun and then flip them over and then flip them over again for like a month or so. And then you can lay them down and plant into them. Okay. So you can do that. You can compost them. Like there's all different kinds of things that you could do with these sad rolls. The other thing you can do is smother. And you guys, there's, there's pros and there are cons to all of these methods that I'm going to talk tonight about how to kill the existing vegetation. But these site prep methods are so, so important. Site prep is basically one of the most important things you're going to do to end up with a successful garden in the long run. So smothering, a con to this is like you're using a ton of plastic and that's not cool. If it's reusable plastic, that's a little bit better because, you know, then at least you can use it again and again and again and not just throw it away. Um, you can use black plastic, clear plastic, thick landscape fabric, like all kinds of things you can use to smother. The key to successful smothering is time. We recommend you smother for at least a whole growing season. And around here in the Great Lakes region, that's going to be like March through November. Um, and I know a lot of you are like, oh no. <laughs> but honestly, that's, that's, going to set you up best in the long run. Um, I've made the mistake of not smothering long enough. I only smothered for like a month or something in the fall and whatever, that's a whole other program. But I didn't kill the grass and I didn't kill the weeds. And then I had a mess for a couple of years to really deal with. Um, smothering is great for just like lawn grass. Like if you're trying to kill that, it's just some normal little weeds in there like clover and whatever. Um, it's not gonna necessarily kill these really persistent noxious weeds like crabgrass or um, goutweed, bindweed, Canada thistle, creeping charlie, like those things that might not kill them in one growing season. And in that case, we recommend this method, which is covering with raw wood chips. So that's a live like wood chips, green wood chips from a live tree. Now, I personally have not tried this method. Um, it is based on some research. I can't even remember her name. She's out of Washington. Anyway, my friend Ken Williams, who's a horticulturist, there's his YouTube and Instagram and whatever. He's got a whole little 10 minute spiel on this method of using green live wood chips to smother these super problem areas that have these really noxious weeds in them. And basically you dump a heck of a lot of raw live wood chips from like a just cut down tree, like 12 to 18 inches thick. And then you just leave it there. You leave it there for at least a year. It might take longer, all right? And for anybody who's had to deal with these weeds, like you understand how awful they can be. Like I'm dealing with buying weed right now and it's just awful, okay? So that's another site prep method. I highly suggest you check, check out Ken's Instagram and YouTube. He's, he's great. All right. And then another op option for site prepping is to herbicide your existing vegetation. And I know that people have a ton of different feelings about this, and that's fine. If you're opposed to using herbicide, don't use it. There's other things you can do. Um, if you're okay with it, we recommend um, at least a couple applications of herbicide, at least a month apart or so um, before you plant. What herbicide should you use? We recommend 3% glyphosate. Just look at the active ingredient on there. Um, glyphosate's going to kill everything that is green and growing that you spray it on. It is not going to do anything to seeds 
that are down in the soil. So if you've got a ton of weed seeds down in that soil, I'm going to show you next. They are just going to grow. Look at that. And that's what can happen. Okay. So backpack sprayer is a handy tool if you're going to use this. You need to follow all safety precautions, obviously. Um, you can see I'm completely covered head to toe. Well, head, I'm just wearing a head net because the mosquitoes are really bad and I don't want to wave my hand in front of my face. Um, you need to do it on a day that's not windy. You need to do it when it's not going to rain right away. So you need to be very safe if you're going to use this method. I've done pretty much all these methods we've talked about tonight, except for the raw live wood chip one. And there's benefits and drawbacks to all of them. Okay. So if you've got all these weeds that pop up after your site prep method, your goal is don't let them make seeds. Okay. So I'm going to talk more about this, but basically all that means is once your weed makes a flower, it's time to get rid of it. Don't let it turn into thousands of seeds blowing around. All right. So now the fun part, let's like start talking about the plants. <laughs> so what is your plant community? Okay. You've like done all this killing and gotten rid of this vegetation and you've created your garden. What community was it? you know, that, that best matches your soil and your light conditions in your eco region where you live. And also think about how high do you want your plants to get? If you want to start a garden and it's in your front yard, I recommend maybe starting with plants that are like under three feet tall. You know, you don't have to have plants that are eight feet tall. You can put stuff in that's lower. This is an example of a garden that's right next to a front door in a house that is in a neighborhood with a homeowner's association. All right, so things need to be kept looking a certain way. Everything in this garden is under, I'd say 18 inches tall. All right, you could see it as a diverse, lush, um, densely planted garden here. And I've got all the plants labeled they're a bunch of my absolute favorites, and I could spend forever talking about them, but I'll just call out the Jacob's Ladder. That's a really great landscaping plant if it's native to your area. Nice mounded form, beautiful bluish purple flowers in the spring. It's a great one. The leaves are semi-evergreen too, so like I can see Jacob's Ladder leaves in February on the ground. That's great, we want that. The same goes for that wild strawberry. Um, I'm gonna show you more pictures of this. The wild strawberry is evergreen. Let me see, I think I have it next. No, I don't, okay. So layers, we want layers, all right? So we're mimicking those natural plant communities. Um, you could see in this picture, this is, I don't know, eight inches tall, but even on the very, very ground layer, we've got tiny new plants growing. And a lot of times people are like compulsive and they wanna rip those plants out. Don't do that. Those might actually end up being really high quality plants that have seeded around. And so I'm gonna wait to remove anything until I can positively identify it, all right? And at the end on a resource slide, I'm gonna show you um, an ID suggestion for you. So we're trying to mimic these dense, layers. Wild strawberry, let's talk about ground layers. Oh my gosh, I'm obsessed with ground layers because they're pretty and they do a job. They suppress weeds. That's what we all want. So if wild strawberry is native to your region and they have a pretty, they've got a pretty far range, um, put it in. It, this plant can take a beating. It can take some foot traffic. Um, it looks beautiful in the spring, summer, fall, and even in the winter. You could dig down through the snow and you'll see those wild strawberry leaves underneath there. They stay under a foot tall, so it's a low growing ground cover. They spread by those running above ground, those runners. Um, in that photo in the bottom where it's the fall, you can see those runners. Super easy to maintain those. 
when those runners grow out onto that little walkway there, you literally take two seconds and just rip them out. Very easy. Um, you do get actual little tiny strawberries, which is really great. And it can do sun or it can do shade. Same with this common violet, okay? It can do sun, shade, dry, medium wet, whatever. Blooms beautifully in April. Um, so these are cool season ground covers, the strawberry and the violet, which means that they start actively growing in the spring. Guess what else starts actively growing in the spring? All different kinds of weeds. <laughs> we need competition in there. If we only have plants in our gardens that start don't start actively growing until June, oh my gosh, April and May are not gonna be fun. So we need these plants that are going to be um, actively growing early in the season as our ground layer, okay? And that's gonna help you out a lot. I let these common violets seed all over my gardens, all over the place, and they do not suppress the growth of other plants. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that in just a minute. So here's what the violets look like. Um, I, you can see I let them seed in between those flagstone stepping stones. You know, their seeds just kind of catapult everywhere. If they end up somewhere where I don't want them, I just rip them out. Maybe I transplant it, maybe I compost it, maybe I give it to a friend, all right? Wild ginger, oh, so gorgeous. This is another one that has a pretty far range. This guy's definitely gonna be happier in the shade, okay? And um, medium to medium wet soil, stays under a foot, again, wonderful ground layer, spreads pretty slowly by rhizomes, not, a, not very aggressive at all. I wish it spread faster, but it is super dense. This is one that has been purported to actually outcompete garlic mustard, which is a hugely noxious weed. Um, so if you can get good stands of wild ginger going, that's awesome. And here's what it looks like in the fall. I love plants that have interest in multiple seasons. All right, so Pennsylvania sedge. Um, I'm smiling because I talk about this plant constantly. <laughs> so this is so adaptable. Pennsylvania sedge is that thing that looks like the flowy grass. It's not grass, it's a sedge. Um, this is what would have made up the understory of our oak woodlands around here. So, and, and lots of different places, not just here in the Great Lakes region. And they do an amazing job. They, they're huge erosion controllers. So they have really kind of fibrousy root systems almost. Um, they spread really slowly by rhizomes. It's not aggressive at all. They do slowly creep out though. Um, and, they're just beautiful looking. They add a nice fine texture to your garden. It's important that you have lots of different textures within your garden. You have things with big broad leaves. You have things with spiky leaves. Um, you have different flower structures. This, these sedges or grasses should kind of make up the matrix, the backbone of your garden. So they should be evenly scattered throughout your garden with like wildflowers kind of scattered amongst or groups of wildflowers in it. You can see this is grouped here with New Jersey tea, which is a really beautiful shrub. Um, sun, part sun stays under four feet. It's a little fussy and rabbits like to graze on it. So I tell people don't put it in a place that's like a focal point. Um, it might come back after it's been grazed on, it might not. All right, so here's the Pennsylvania sedge in the spring. So again, early season um, active growers, and that's what sedges are. And I mean, I see them now in March, they're greening up right now, it's amazing. And so they're gonna help suppress our weeds. And they get those cool little, look at those spiky little crazy flower structures, it's really cool. And then here we go. Here's this diverse layer of um, sedges and ginger and all kinds of stuff in there out in a natural area. All right, maidenhair fern. 
This is great for a small shady garden. They are so delicate. Okay. They're not going to do well with competing with crazy aggressive things, especially really tall things. Um, so if you've got like a nice small little garden, this is gorgeous. All right. And it definitely needs shade. It's going to dry out if it's got too much sun, um, but it can handle dry soil, can handle moist soil, but it needs shade. All right. Excellent as an edger. I, I love it. And then we've got our geranium columbine combo. And this brings up a point. So something that you need to realize about native plant gardens is plants move around. We are not trying to maintain a static environment. We are not trying to keep everything, you know, the way it is. If you're going to embrace native plant gardening, you need to embrace the discovery. And you've got to embrace the fact that these plants are going to move around and your garden is going to change. You cannot be super fussy and super particular. You'd be like, no, you have to only grow right here. Okay. So here's why geranium, this is a great example that light purple flower on the left spreads by catapulting seeds. Literally, the seeds are like ballistic and fling out like 15 feet away or something. It's crazy, <laughs> but extremely cool. Why wouldn't you want that seeding all over your garden, right? Then next to it, we have columbine, that dark red one. Super great, beautiful, right? Guess what? This garden does not look like this anymore because columbine, okay, those seeds in the fall, you know, the seed head gets all dry and they just fall out. They fall on the ground. Now, columbine is a plant that the seeds need soil disturbance in order for them to germinate. So all of these different plants have like a role in what's called succession, which is an ecological process. And I describe it like it's a relay race. So there's some plants, who are the first leg of the relay. Columbine is an example of that, all right? They're going to have the baton and they're gonna grow right away from seed, right after the soil is disturbed. And when I say that, like maybe it's your dog dug a hole, maybe water carved something through the soil, whatever. So things like soil or things like Columbine, things like Black-Eyed Susan, um, Monarda punctata, like there's other things too that are these early successional pioneer species. They're going to have the baton for the first couple of years. Okay. Then, if there's no soil disturbance happening, if you're not digging holes in there, water's not running through it, they're going to hand the baton off to the next round of species. Okay. Things like years three through five that are going to germinate. So maybe that's plants like that wild geranium. So the columbine's gonna fade out eventually. The geranium's gonna kinda take over and uh, is gonna have the baton. And then after five years or so, there's gonna be another set of plants that start growing in and amongst that. And those are the really high quality things like shooting star and whatever, all kinds of other stuff. So, Here's what happens though. When a disturbance happens at say year seven or something, guess what seeds are just hanging around in the soil waiting for a disturbance? Columbine. So guess what's gonna grow where your dog dug that hole in the garden? Columbine. Awesome, that's what we want, okay? Now here's the thing. If it starts growing in a ridiculous place that you really don't want it, obviously you're gonna edit it out and you are not gonna feel bad at all, <laughs> okay? Give it to a friend, whatever. So this is the fun of these native plant gardens. Your job is to kind of step back and see what's happening. Never let weeds make seeds and edit it to make it kind of into what you want it to be eventually. And then here's an example of remnant wild geranium in an oak woodland. Remnant just means it's always grown there. Nobody planted it. To me, that's the best. That's so cool. 
All right, so shrubs. Now, all these different kinds of plants we're talking about tonight, they've all got different root systems and shrubs are no exception. So some shrubs spread um, clonally or they're gonna put out these like spreading suckers. When you've got a shrub that does that, like this dwarf bush honeysuckle, which is native, okay? It's not the non-native Japanese honeysuckle. Um, it's going to take up whatever space it's in. So for me, as a foundation planting, that's fabulous. Let it spread, let those suckers come. And it does sucker out into the lawn. And guess what? We just mow over the suckers and it's extremely easily controlled that way. Um, so to me, I embrace that and put those clonal shrubs in an area where they're going to be allowed to do that and do that job for me, okay? So what's cool about that is that there's not going to be a ton of open space under those shrubs during the growing season. And you can see they pretty densely cover the soil, which is really nice. Dwarf bush honeysuckle is just loved by pollinators. I, I love this shrub. It can do dry soil, um, medium soil. It could probably even handle medium wet, sun, shade. I mean, I've got it planted in really not good foundation fill soil and in full sun. And it is absolutely just doing wonderfully. The flowers aren't super showy whatever, I don't care. This plant is doing a really great job for me, but the insects love it, which is great. Okay, so plant communities for sun. Let's talk about our top layer here. So these are gonna be some sun loving. A lot of them are gonna be prairie type plants. Prairies are just these open sunny habitats um, that are found here in the Great Lakes and then pretty much west of us. So Culver's root is one of my favorites for small gardens. It does still get some height, okay? So it does still get up to five feet. It's not gonna be happy with dry soil, medium. So just like that normal black kind of loamy soil to moist. Moist is where it's gonna be exceptionally happy. Um, it stays upright and very well behaved. Even when there's snow falling on it, it still maintains this upright structure, which is beautiful. Even in the winter, it looks gorgeous, okay? And those white spikes of the, I, to me, they look like candelabras or something. You guys, the pollinators that cover them, it's phenomenal. I mean, just these gorgeous wasps and flies and beetles and bees and oh my gosh, everything, everything. It's just, it's wonderful. And then I like that combined with Rattlesnake Master, which is, um, it looks like a yucca. It's related to yucca. With these really interesting spiky kind of flower structures on there. And I've actually seen hummingbirds come to that, which is crazy because it's not this super showy flower. But it's really, really interesting. And I like that pairing together. Um, I also really like um, Prairie Drop Seed, which is that flowy fountainy grass there. This is something that is perfect for formal landscapes, especially when you mass them together, all right? And then you can see in behind it, we've got the culver's root. It hadn't bloomed yet. Even when it's not in bloom, look at that plant structure. Look at those leaves. That's gorgeous, especially when you pair that with the opposite fine texture of the prairie drop seed. It's stunning. Um, the thing about prairie drop seed that you need to know is that if you plant like a little half pint plug, it's gonna take at least three years for it to reach this mature size. So just be patient, okay? In this picture, what am I missing? <laughs> cool season ground layer. Look at that bare soil under that prairie drop seed. And guess what is battled in this garden in the spring? Tons of weeds. Yeah, not fun. All right, so there's some mistakes and some successes here. Some mistakes. In the very back, there's that like spiky plant that's called Ohio spiderwort. And then there's also some golden Alexander way in the back, that yellow flower planted in a new garden with bare soil and it's rich soil. 
those plants went to town and they were super aggressive and they went crazy all over and it looked awful. Okay. So that was a mistake. Don't plant plants that are too aggressive for a small garden. So when you're looking in the nursery catalog, and I'm going to give you some nursery recommendations at the end, and they say that it's aggressive and not appropriate for a small space, please believe them. All right. Something that I did correctly down here. We've got our prairie drop seeds, those fountainy, finely textured grasses on the left and the right. Sandwiched in the middle is prairie coreopsis. Now, it's not blooming yet. Prairie coreopsis is this beautiful yellow flower. Anyway, prairie coreopsis spreads by rhizomes. See the little picture there? It's like these threads, these thread-like root systems that run through the soil at the very top of the soil. So they can spread aggressively, though the coreopsis, those rhizomes. But what happens is those rhizomes run into that amazing root structure of the prairie drop seed. Check out that graphic on the left there. And it's just insanely hairy and it's really dense at the very top. It's amazing. So those rhizomes run into that and they just stop, like they hit a brick wall. It's so cool. And this is what I mean when you want a diversity of plants, you want grasses, you want flowers, you want shrubs, you want a diversity as much as you can above ground, but as well as below ground. So some of these rhizome spreaders, you can stick them in between these bunch grasses and it's gonna keep them from spreading like crazy, okay? And then here's, oh my gosh, prairie drop seed in the late summer slash early fall as an edger in an extremely manicured neighborhood, all right? Native plants can go anywhere, any kind of neighborhood, rural, urban, I don't care. They can look absolutely beautiful. It's all in how you edit your garden and the plant choices that you make. Speaking of plant choices, prairie flax. I'm obsessed with this plant, flax pelosa. So this isn't garden flax. It's not gar flax paniculata. We're talking about prairie flax here. It's going to stay under a couple feet. Brilliant pink flowers on it. Um, it's a showstopper. You see it from the road. It's going to bloom in June, which is nice. So that's early summer, which means that these leaves are going to start growing earlier in, in the spring. Awesome, you've got ground coverage then early in the spring. That's what you want. And here's what it looks like out in nature. Absolutely gorgeous at the Schulenberg Prairie at Morton Arboretum. I highly recommend if anybody is ever in the Chicago area that you visit this prairie, it's phenomenal. Okay, and then we've got aromatic aster. So in a native plant garden, you want things that are gonna be blooming. So you want sets of plants blooming in the spring, in the summer and in the fall, all right? Because we want that pollinator food source. And plus it's just pretty <laughs> to have these successive bloom periods for your garden. Aromatic aster is one of the latest blooming asters around here. Um, so, okay, so some asters get tall and leggy and floppy in gardens. I'm not a fan of that, like how that looks. Aromatic aster, though, has a very dense, mounding, almost shrub-like habit to it, which is very unique with the asters, okay? And covered, densely covered in these dark purple flowers in like mid to late September slash early October, when the monarchs are starting to migrate. So this is a great food source, nectar source for those migrating monarchs, which is really cool. Now, this is an aggressive rhizome spreader, all right? So you could either put it in a space where you're like, hey, go to town, take up this whole area, I don't care. <laughs> or you could do the thing where you sandwich it, you know, between competing bunch grasses and get those rhizomes to stop that way. I love this plant. It is a workhorse plant for me. Even in the winter, it looks awesome. It maintains that mounding habit and it looks absolutely gorgeous. Um, super easy to transplant too in like April when it first starts coming up. All right. 
So some ground covering plants for our sun areas, things like prairie smoke. Oh gosh, this plant, it's beautiful. It's so incredibly sweet. I'm, I'm sighing because I was just staring at mine this morning as it was covered with snow. Anyway, um, stays under a foot. This is one that likes it dry. You can do medium soil too. And it's gonna bloom like this in early May. It's just absolutely gorgeous. I wish it spread fast, but it doesn't. It spreads pretty slowly by rhizomes, but you can split those up and transplant them. And the smoke comes from the seed structures that develop in June. Um, so those long wispy things are called akines. The seed is like down on the inside, whatever you pull on those little wispy things. And when the seeds are ripe, they'll like gently dislodge. This is stunning and beautiful when you see this. It's like this smoky wispy situation. This is one of the perfect like ground cover plants. Now you can't walk on it, all right? But you just dot this throughout your sun garden and um, you're gonna get a good dense kind of soil coverage from it in the early spring as well. Oh, bumblebees love this plant. Okay, so those flowers, bumblebees are like some of the only insects that can get up inside. They're strong enough to pry those petals apart and they shake their bodies it's called sonication and um, it dislodges the pollen and it's super cool. Okay, so things like the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee love prairie smoke. All right, so here's prairie smoke in nature. I'm so excited when I find it not in a garden, but out in nature, it's awesome. Remnant prairie smoke and um, prairie pussy toes or field pussy toes, whatever. Those are another very small, awesome ground cover option for your shade or sorry, for your sun gardens. Okay, spread slowly by rhizomes. All right, so here's an example of a prairie community in a tiny garden and what it looks like in May on the left versus what it looks like in June on the right. And there's so much happening here. So our dense ground layer of violets and prairie smoke, that's the cool season ground layer, ground layer on the left, all right? That's kind of taking the stage in May. Transition to like mid to late June on the right. You could see that those violets and the prairie smoke, like that did not, suppress anything from growing. So we've got our finely textured prairie drop seed is the grass. We've got the orange butterfly milkweed, okay? We've got the yellow prairie coreopsis. The white dotted in there is the New Jersey tea. And there's other plants growing in here too, you just can't see them, all right? So this is a tiny little community, a very narrow border sidewalk and driveway garden and it's alive with life and extremely easy to maintain. So easy because we let those violets just seed all over the place and they really cut down on weeds for the whole growing season. What time is it? Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm totally gonna go over. Okay, here's that garden from a different perspective in July. All right, plants for those really tricky situations where sometimes it's wet and sometimes it's dry. The community that you're mimicking with that, the plant community is a sedge meadow or sometimes fen plants, where fen can be a very specialized community requiring really certain mineral conditions. But anyway, there's some basic plants, set of plants that are gonna do fine in dry and in wet, all right? Um, things like the red kernel flower on the left here. This is Jessica and Kyle Mino in uh, Woodstock. They have this really awesome little tiny rain garden in their backyard. Okay, they have a small yard in a residential neighborhood and they are cramming native plants in there. It's amazing. Um, and it looks beautiful and it looks like it fits the neighborhood too. So cardinal flower, swamp milkweed, grape blue lobelia, and then the matrix is the fox sedge, all right, down there in that bottom, that fountainy thing. 
it's basically the like medium to moist answer to prairie drop seed. Prairie drop seeds like on the drier end, fox sedge is going to be on the wetter end and look very similar in habit. Okay, so lots of like this is just absorbing all kinds of rainwater. This is supporting pollinators. It's doing so much. Sometimes it's super wet, sometimes it's dry, and it all thrives. Prairie Blazing Star is another one that could do medium to moist soil. Um, it likes full sun and it's going to get up to five feet tall. All right, here's where this plant looks bad. This plant looks bad when it's got no competition around it because it's just going to grow extremely tall and then it's going to all lay over like this. It needs a ton of plants around it. And I'm talking like right up against it. All right. Like all kinds of plants in one little square foot, jam them in there. And that's when this guy is going to look the best. This is actually a public garden that anybody can visit in Woodstock, okay, on Lake Avenue right next to the police station. Okay, so with the design process, you can get as detailed or whatever as you want. You know, you don't have to do this whole graph paper situation. Um, sometimes I'll do this. Sometimes I'll like eyeball the square footage of an area and know like, right, I need one plant per square foot. Um, I want a bunch of grasses. I start with my grasses and my shrubs. So I start with that. And then I get my flowers kind of interspersed throughout. Plants, if you want a more formal looking garden, um, having less number of species is generally recommended in the design world, whatever. Sometimes I disagree with that. I think it's more about having like, three colors, kind of two to three colors blooming at once, not having like, you know, 17 different things all blooming at one time, kind of limiting your color palette. So like back here, we had our main three colors are white, orange, and yellow with the green backdrop and green's always kind of there. It doesn't count as one of the colors. Okay. So limiting the colors blooming at one time is is kind of a way to make it look more formal. Whatever, you don't have to do that. Do what makes you happy, you know, with your garden. But those cool season ground covers, the grasses and the shrubs, those are all extremely important things. Um, and planting densely. If you can't afford, <laughs> which this has happened to me so many times, you can't afford to plant like this whole giant area. Um, it's help people to plant in pods. So dense, start with like densely planted little circles um, that you can budget for. And then those plants are gonna creep out. And in the meantime, any bare soil, you gotta keep those weeds down. And we're gonna talk about that, how to maintain stuff. So where do you buy these plants and what do you do with these plants? All right, so where do you buy them? I'm gonna give you some resources at the end. Um, what do you do with them? So with your design, it could be as simple as short in the front, tall in the center or in the back, whatever. I also like to do it asymmetrical sometimes, um, taller on one end and then kind of sloping down. I like how that looks too. Kidney shaped, you know, kidney shaped gardens are nice, whatever. Don't do like straight, necessarily straight lines, curves can look nice. Um, all right, I already talked about that. So these plants, when you're putting them in, um, I really like to use a soil knife. Soil knife is like one of my go-to tools. And um, the dimensions are marked on there. And guess what? Soil knives, most of them are a foot long. So there you go. There's your one plant every foot. There's your marking orange handle so you don't lose it. That's awesome. Um, plant these plants. Um, and then water them pretty good for at least a few weeks, water them. Um, if you're planting in the dead of the summer, like if you're planting in July, plan on watering for potentially the next few months. Um, don't use wood mulch. I know this picture shows wood mulch. We don't recommend that. That's not doing anything really for the soil. Everybody's like, oh, it suppresses weeds. 
not unless you put like eight inches of it down. Don't, we don't want that. Um, you can use leaf mulch. It's gonna give a similar look that first year of the garden as wood mulch. And it's actually going to enrich the soil in the long run. And if you want uh, to seed in Black-Eyed Susan in all the empty spaces in your garden, Black-Eyed Susan is pretty cheap from seed. It's gonna come off the first year that you seed it in, but it's not gonna bloom the first year, okay? But it is gonna cover, help cover the soil, which is exactly what we want. It'll bloom the second year because it's a biennial, okay? And then eventually it's gonna fade out unless there's disturbance. It's one of those plants. All right, so maintenance, this is so, so important. Basically, I feel like I'm not, I can come up with this like design, like I can do this all I want. Those plants are gonna move all over the place. And it's my job to edit and make it look the way I want. So plants move here. Oh, I actually really like that there. I'm gonna leave that or they don't. And then my other job is to keep the weeds down so my plants can spread. And I do that with a hoe. I am not pulling, I'm not using a trowel and digging anything by the roots that creates a huge soil disturbance. Weed seeds thrive and the soil disturbance, we don't want that. A hoe is going to cut the, the root of the plant just below the soil surface. You're barely creating any disturbance whatsoever. Now you are not totally killing the weed the first time you do that. It's going to grow back, but it's going to be weakened. And then your goal is to go through again with a hoe and get them again, maybe a week or two later. Don't wait for them to get huge. The hoe is not gonna work. You gotta do these when the weeds are small. Here's the thing though. It takes, it's so much faster for you to be able to weed a garden with a hoe than with a trowel and like digging all these plants by the roots. Therefore, you're more likely to do it more often, okay? Um, there's different kinds of hoes. There's the tall stand-up ones, those long-handled hoes, which are really nice if you're like, I don't wanna bend down. <laughs> I don't want to kneel, you know, that's hard to do. Those are a great option for that. Um, in my new gardens where there's like more space between the plants, I tend to use those long handled hoes more. Um, in my established gardens, I'm using that tiny little small handheld hoe a lot because um, I'm able to do fine little intricate kind of work with it. Um, keep a nice edge in your garden, whatever that looks like. You don't always have to cut, you know, an edge with a spade. Certain gardens I have, I do that because I want that look. And then other gardens, I just don't. And I just like mow the edge of it with my mower, okay? And leave leaves and all that organic plant matter in your garden, leave it there. There's so many insects that live under those leaves that have eggs on those leaves, that have um, chrysalises or cocoons that look like those leaves, beautiful moths and butterflies and all kinds of stuff. There's tiny little solitary bees that will overwinter inside your plant stems. So please leave your stems. Right now, there's so many people, it's mid-March, they wanna cut, they wanna start cleaning up their gardens, right? cut all their plant material down to the ground. I'm begging you not to do that. And if you have to cut your plant stems, leave at least 15 inches from the ground up. Um, research has found that those little native solitary bees are actually overwintering in that first 15 inches of the stem stubble, or there's going to be bees in like I don't know, a month, month and a half that are gonna to start to be active and they're going to nest down in that stem stubble. Stems are really important. Okay, or another method of native plant garden maintenance is just burning the heck out of it. Around now, um, so February, March, something like that, obviously your local regulations need to allow this and, um, you need to know what you're doing. You need to take a ton of safety precautions and blah, blah, blah. I 
I recommend that you see if your local land trust offers any prescribed burning for homeowners classes, okay? In some states, you do need a permit in order to be able to do this. Here in Illinois, um, the state of Illinois EPA website, you can get a burn, it's a free burn permit that you have to fill out in order to be able to do this. But if your local regulations do not allow it, then it doesn't matter if you have that permit, you cannot burn like this. This is really great though, if you can burn your native plants, they thrive on it. Um, if you can't burn them, that's okay. That's all right, you know, you can just cut your stems and cut it down to that 15 inches and whatever, and leave that organic material laying on the ground and it'll all be fine. All right, so one program that we run is called Conservation at Home. And this is a program for homeowners and we do it for businesses too and organizations, whatever, Conservation at Work. Um, where it's basically you get some native plants in your yard, you start to remove some invasives and you qualify to get a little yard sign, which is really cool, okay? And it can bring some, you stick it in your garden and it brings some intention to that garden, okay? And it's a neat way to talk to your neighbors about it. The fee for the program, um, well, this is a regional program that was started by the Conservation Foundation and it's being done in multiple states now. So I do it here in McHenry County, but there's lots of other people doing it in other areas. If you want to be connected with somebody, just email me and I'll connect you. But what happens is we come over, we do a site visit, we walk your property, we make plant recommendations, we help you with ID, and it doesn't end there. You know, we're not just like one and done. No, anytime questions come up, you email me, okay? And I will get back to you. If you stay a member of the Land Conservancy, because the fee includes a membership, I'll come back out and do another site visit for you. I don't care. You know, <laughs> so we're there to support your goals and doing what you want to do. All right. So it's a great program. And here we go. How far over did I go? 12 minutes. Resources. So a bunch of local places to buy native plants. I highly recommend, I don't care where you are in the country, find your local Wild Ones chapter. That's a national nonprofit with chapters all over and they do native plant sales. Find your local land trust. A lot of them do native plant sales, including us. We're doing ours right now. And you guys, it is selling out like gangbusters. I can't even keep up with it. Don't wait to order your plants, okay? Oh, it's, it's crazy. Um, there's local business, sometimes little local places that sell stuff, you know, just check it all out. There's mail order options too, I put some there. Um, some great books. I can't say enough about those books. You guys, I'm like a book freak. And so those, how many did I put? Four or five, whatever, however many are there. I love them. They're fantastic. Heather Holm is a great person to follow like on social media, on Instagram. I think it's, I don't remember what her handle is. Look up pollinators of native plants or something and Heather Holm, she's great with insects and native plants and stuff. All of them are fantastic. Okay, other things. Illinois Wildflowers, we run a Facebook group called Learn, Landowner Ecology and Restoration Network, free private Facebook group, just join it, post your questions, post your observations. Bunch of like botanists and restoration ecologists and knowledgeable landowners are gonna share information with you and answer your questions. Um, some great Instagram stuff, there's, well, okay, some Instagram stuff. There's mine on there, I'm not gonna say it's great. I only do plants on it. Um, then my friend Ken's, his is great. His is great. And the Land Conservancy in McHenry County. Um, and then the iNaturalist app for learning how to identify things when you're out in nature. We like that as a free app. It's pretty good. Um, especially if the plant has a flower on it. It's, it's pretty decent. It's not hundred percent. None of these plant ID apps are, um, but we really like that one. Okay. With that, I'm going to look at the Q&A box. You guys, thank you so much. I know I'm going over here and I'm trying to be fast. 
this. Sometimes when I get talking about plants, it's just too much. I just go on. All right, Peter has about 300 square feet, shaded more than sunny. You'd like to have shrubs, bushes, flowers, et cetera, for birds and insects. What would work in this space? All right, so I just went through a bunch of that kind of stuff. So <laughs> things for part shade would probably, I'm guessing, be right for you. Um, 300 square feet is kind of small. So personally, I would stay, um, I don't know, I'd stay with some stuff that's shorter, under four feet or so. Get your, get your flowers in there, okay? Get your, your grasses in there. Some of these grasses can handle part shade. It's going to depend on how much shade you have as far as what grass I would recommend. But sedges are going to be your friend too. Sedges, most sedges are really shade friendly. Um, the New Jersey tea can handle, and see, I don't know where you are, Peter, so it's hard for me um, to recommend stuff. I don't know if you're native here where I am. So there's a, there's just a ton. I would, Peter, what I would do is go back. Oh, you guys are going to be set this recording. Go back and look at that plant community slide for, for shade that I showed. Um, it's got a ton of different stuff in it. Okay. Oh, the other thing, you guys, Prairie Moon, where is it? Their website, prairiemoon.com. If you're here in the Midwest, they've got an amazing plant filter option that you can go on their website, choose like filter. I want plants that are going to stay under three feet that are purple and will bloom in June or whatever for this soil. Like you can filter all that down and it's going to give you options. And then you can look at each plant and tell down to the county level where it's native to, because it gives you the range maps as well. So Prairie Moon is a fantastic resource for that. All right, Kathleen, for open lawn areas, I've heard it's beneficial to mix clover in with existing grass. Is there a particular clover that's native to Northern Illinois? Not, no, Kathleen, not that's gonna be like a lawn substitute. So I know, I know that. I know that people are like, mix red clover in with your lawn. The bees love it. I mean, you know what the bees really love is native plants. <laughs> so, all right. So cut down on the amount of lawn that you have for one thing. I mean, you don't have to get rid of all of it, but cut down on the amount that you can and, and then have a diverse set of native plants in your gardens. Now for these lawn areas, I mean, you don't need to support bees in your necessarily in your lawn. Get those plants in there. That's going to be the high quality pollen and nectar, all right? That's gonna be, and get the shrubs in there too, all right? Those are really important. A lot of shrubs have like really nutrient dense pollen, okay? The clover isn't even gonna touch. Personally, I wouldn't bother doing it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste the money on it, okay? Um, to promote a healthy lawn, you there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, use an organic fertilizer instead of a synthetic fertilizer. Um, you can seed in different kinds of lawn types, these fine leaved fescues, Prairie Moon, and there's other companies too that have these fine leaved fescues that um, are going to have deeper roots and are going to be more drought tolerant. Like Prairie Moon has one called Ecograss. That's fantastic. So I would look into that kind of stuff instead of clover. We don't need more clover necessarily. All right, Kathy, what was the plant that spreads by rhizomes that you suggest to put next to long-rooted plants? That was probably the prairie coreopsis, um, coreopsis palmata. So again, you guys are going to be sent this recording like tomorrow or something. So you'll have it too. And then... Kathy, could you show that photo of bed along the sidewalk or driveway in two seasons? Yeah, I'll go back to it in a minute, okay? Because I can't do it while I have the question thing up. Um, and Jenny, what do you do with your weeds after you hold them up? Good question, Jenny. Um, I put them in, like we have a brush pile 
just because we're always removing whatever invasive brush and stuff like that. So I end up throwing it all in there and it gets burned like once a season. Um, so they just decompose in there. So that's what I do with my weeds. Um, if you don't have that option of burning them, you can usually people are able to get rid of them with their, you know, garbage service or something like that. I don't recommend composting your weeds. I mean, all right, this can get tricky. So composting weeds that have flowers, some of them can still go to seed. And then you've got weed seeds in your compost. Most residential compost, like compost in your backyard is not gonna get hot enough to truly, truly deal and kill weed seeds, okay? So I, I don't personally compost my weeds. I just kind of have them all in a pile that starts to decompose and then it all gets burned up. Okay. Kathleen, I moved into a house that has large, mostly empty wood mulch beds. Do I need to remove that mulch before I plant? No, you don't have to. So you can leave the mulch. What I recommend doing, because eventually that mulch is going to break down. If you don't keep replacing it every single year, it's going to break down within three years, depending on how thick it is. So when you're planting your tiny little plant, just scoot the mulch out of the way, put your plant in the ground, don't have the mulch touching the plant, okay? It can really trap and hold moisture and heat in there and that can burn some of these tiny little plants. It can encourage mold to develop if that mulch is right up on them and it's holding that heat and moisture in. So just keep the mulch away from, um, away from the plants. Okay. Yes, Erin, I'm going to share the recording, and I'm glad that you liked it. Okay, so somebody asked that I go back. Yes, that I go back to different seasons of this very narrow front sidewalk garden. Um, here it is, spring versus summer. So cool season ground covers, which you mainly see there along the ground. It's a ton of violet. Okay, and you know, people think of violets as this like lawn weed that they have to kill. A, it's native, no, you don't, and B, you don't need to do that. It's actually supporting a lot of different pollinators. I could talk to you guys about violets forever. But look at, I have the wrong name. I did this whole program with the wrong name. <laughs> with the wrong name, I'm like, that's my boss's name. Here, I'm gonna change it right now for you guys so you know my actual, I can't, okay. My name is Sarah. All right, whatever. So yes, you guys, you guys, thanks for hanging in with me here. If any of you are still watching, um, find your local land trust, get involved, reach out. If you have questions, there's my email right there. Feel free to write, reach out. It's super cool. Like during COVID, I've been doing all these webinars and like, I am talking to people from all over the country. And hearing their stories, they're telling me their stories and they're like asking me questions about their gardens. And it's really, really cool. You know, now I don't know about plants like in Washington state, like I'm not going to pretend like I can recommend to you, but there are some plant family similarities, you know, um, amongst the regions. So that's kind of neat to see those similarities too. Okay. Anyway. Become a member of your land trust, reach out, volunteer, follow all these social media things and enjoy your plants, okay? Thank you guys so much for being with us here tonight. Did I miss a question now? I think I did. Oh, oh, good, thank you. <laughs> the Ludwig. I Googled the name you showed for this presentation and was wondering why you look so different. <laughs> because I'm a dork and didn't even change the name. Sarah McHale, there you go. All right, thank you guys so much for joining us. Have a good night. You'll be sent this recording, I don't know, tomorrow or something. Everybody have a good night. Okay, bye.